I was a teenager in the 1990s in Northwest Washington, there were a few groups of people I thought were cooler than the skiers, snowboarders, and mountain bikers who knew how to skirt the edges of what was allowed or even legal in order to access better snow, better trails, so forth. These were ski bums who I would see ducking ski boundary lines to access backcountry slopes that I was too scared to follow. Or these pioneering mountain bikers who assured me that the no trespassing signs on Galbraith Mountain could be ignored. I did follow them. Well, tourism development in recent years has seriously challenged these groups, especially those centered in the Western American ski industry. Welcome to Riding Westward. I'm your host, Brennan Rensink. This month, we talk with author and journalist Heather Hansman about the history, present, and potential futures of these peoples and spaces that so entranced my naive teenage imagination. Her book, Powder Days, Ski Bums, Ski Towns, and the Future of Chasing Snow, was published by Hanover Square Press in 2021 and is coming out in November 2023 in paperback. Thanks for listening. For new listeners, allow me to take a moment to explain a bit about writing Westward and myself. Each episode features a conversation with people writing about the North American West, historians, journalists, novelists, poets, scientists, sociologists, and others. By showcasing their work, I hope to spark your curiosity to think more deeply about the region, its lands and environments, and the histories and experiences of the peoples who call it home. If a writer or topic intrigues you, you can find links to their work in the show notes or at writingwestward.org. And if you have a moment, please do subscribe, share links with friends, leave us a review or rating on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you're using to listen, follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and send in some feedback. Writing Westward is supported by the Charles Red Center for Western Studies at Brigham Young University, where I, Brendan Rensink, serve as Associate Director and an Associate Professor of History. For better or worse, this is a one-man operation with me playing role of host, producer, sound engineer, publicist, and everything else, all tasks for which I have no training. But I am passionate about the North American West, so this difficult work is well worth the excuse to read more books and talk to interesting people. At the end of each episode, I'll include a little bit more information about me and my scholarship and about the Red Center, our public programming and projects, and funding opportunities that you could apply for. With that, let me introduce a little bit more about today's guest and why we're talking to them. Heather Hansman is an award-winning journalist whose work appears in places like The Atlantic and The New York Times. She's a contributing editor at Outside Magazine, the author of two books, Downriver, Into the Future of Water in the West, published in 2019 by the University of Chicago Press, and Powder Days, Ski Bums, Ski Towns, and the Future of Chasing Snow, published in 2021 by Hanover Square Press and coming out in November 2023 in paperback. She lives in Durango, Colorado, where she's working on her next book, Fierce Country, which is about underrepresented women in the outdoors. In Powder Days, the book we discuss today, Hansman revisits the ski bum communities and ski towns where she herself was a ski bum of sorts in the mid-2000s. She returns asking questions about the history of those communities and their culture, and especially in the West, where many of these locations have become dominated by expensive luxury resorts. She's asking questions about how those worlds are changing under the extreme pressures they face. These are themes we have dealt with previously on the podcast, but they are contemporary issues I feel are important enough to revisit again and again. Westerners need to think critically about how and where we engage in recreation and the impacts of our land use on those actual locations and the actual people who live there and are involved in maintaining the economies and infrastructures that make our access to the outdoors possible. And by extension, the decisions we need to make as societies about their sustainability. Skiers will obviously find much to chew on here, but all Westerners are touched by these issues and really do need to spend some serious time and thought with them. Heather Hansman, welcome to Running Westward. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, here in Utah, we recently got some rainstorms that dumped quite a few inches of snow up in the tops of the mountains. So I think this is a fortuitous time to talk with you about the history of skiing and ski bums and ski towns in the West. Um, as I think a lot of us now have snow on the mind. Did you guys get some down in, in Colorado? We did. Yeah, there's snow on the high peaks and it's supposed to be freezing down in town where I live this week. So it's coming. <laughs> Yeah, I'm. We're a lot of us here in town are starting to ask if because we had a couple of skiffs of snow a few weeks ago and it all melted out. 
And we're wondering, like, I think it's more than it's going to be able to melt out. So this may be the start of the snowpack. And actually, we didn't even melt out over the summer. There was some snowpack left up there. So hopefully another yeah. good season. Yeah, it was a big year last year. And I feel like that's kind of how the snowpack always goes in the Inner Mountain West, where we get those early storms and everyone thinks it's coming. And then it goes high and dry for, you know, till the end of November. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. Or a, a, a few years ago, the first year that um, I took my kids up snowboarding, uh, they we got, had like a great December or something. And then we went, it was like six weeks without any new snow. And it was not, not great conditions. Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> I'm sure we'll get to into learn this. on. <laughs> yeah. Or I'm sure we'll get into it later, but I feel like that's sort of how climate change is kind of taking the snowpack that things are getting weirder and more variable and we get big yeah. storms and then nothing for a long time. So. Yes, that's kind of like where I want to maybe end this. Is we that's kind of a bummer of a note to end on, but um, <laughs> to kind of get to looking towards towards the future. Um, so let's get into it. So this uh, book, you kind of take this dive into the world of ski bums, um, of which you were one back in the mid two thousands, I think it was. Um, can you define this term for us? What what is a ski bum? Sure. Yeah, and that's something I thought about a lot in framing up this book because in a lot of ways, I think ski bum sort of like a not great phrase or it's a little icky or it comes with some is sort it derogatory of like, i think it's one of those interesting ones where it if you claim it yourself maybe it's not derogatory but if somebody else calls you that then it is um and one of the things i think about so to back up to your question a little bit i think my framing or my idea about what a ski bum is is that somebody who has fully devoted their life to skiing where like in the hierarchy of things that might be important in your life, like a job or relationship or community uh, that skiing kind of ranks out above all those things. And they're sort of this like food, I think, shelter, like sure, the necessities sure, yeah. for survival. But <laughs> yeah. this like for these people, skiing takes priority to all that. Yeah. Yeah. And that you kind of frame your life around that idea of chasing snow or, you know, being in the mountains as much as possible. Is this different than um, like the dirt bag life, you know, like which it's sometimes that's maybe more applied to um, climbers who just live to be, you know, in Yosemite climbing as much as possible. Or is, yeah, there, just lot, is there a bags, lot of overlap? Yeah, I think there's overlap. I think dirt bags may be a little bit more all encompassing and broader. And I think there are these sort of dirt bag cultures in a lot of outdoor sports, you know, climbing, kayaking, you know, there are these things. And I think skiing so interesting because it is, I think it's sort of maybe not the oldest of those things, but it has this sort of like named culture. And I think more than a lot of those things, ski bum culture is really tagged to these ski towns that gets kind of like based around ski mountains and these places, you know, these specific places where you can do it. So there is this kind of culture that builds up. And I think Yosemite is a good example of where that happens in other dirt, dirt bag culture, but, you know, ski bum culture really is tied to these specific places. Yeah. Maybe with some of those other recreational activities, they're much more mobile and, you know, you can go hiking wherever, but if you want to do certain kinds of skiing, you are more tied to specific places that have um, infrastructure built to facilitate some of what you want to do. So maybe that does uh, lead to the formation of like a more uh, robust or a, a, a different kind of culture. If it's more rooted in place where people then are at the same place interacting, you know, for season after season after season. Yeah. Yeah. It's like you come back and it is very seasonal. And I thought a lot, you know, in thinking about this book too, about that idea and kind of where it came from. And I think there is this really, maybe climbing has the same thing, but I think there really is this kind of like self-reverential culture around the idea of a ski bum. And that comes from ski movies and all this kind of other, you know, cultural ephemera about it too. But I think there is this sort of the ski bum in particular, I think, and maybe because I'm in that culture a bit, but there is this sort of specific idea of it. Yeah. Is there um some debates over kind of like authenticity and like who's like like insider outsider dynamics, like who's like the a real member of this community and who's not? Oh sure. And I think that's true of any kind of like small specific culture. And I think there really can be, this is another thing that I kind of struggled with in the book is that there can really be some gatekeeping around the idea. And there can be this sort of, you know, I insider outsider tension, depending on who, who considers himself an insider. And I think there can, 
you know, one of the kind of problematic things about the idea of a ski bum is if you, I think for a long time, if you like had that picture in your head or you looked at that media about skiing, the archetype of the ski bum was this pretty specific, you know, white man who was physically and financially able to do this thing. So I think there is some sort of problematic, you know, frameworks around who could be in or out. But I think there is also this kind of small towny, you know, who's the coolest person, who's the best, you know, a lot of that sort of cultural capital also comes from how good you are in a lot of ways. Yeah. You like can earn your place in the community with, yeah, if you yeah. have the skills. Like you can't just show up and like claim yourself. <laughs> yeah. You got to go prove it. Uh, and this may become, we'll come out in our conversation, but you know, as you know, the feasibility of a ski bomb life maybe becomes more and more tenuous and we're going to, we'll get into this kind of the changing economics and demographics of these towns. Um, I suspect those tensions are only going to kind of, I don't know, it, it's going to do something to, uh, to those dynamics. And I wonder if people will kind of entrench even deeper into, uh, holding on to, you know, who gets to be part of the community or not as they're under so much, so much stress. Sure. Um, sure. Um, you write about uh, Western frontier mythology and how it resonates with with ski culture, at least how some ski bums kind of view themselves. Can you t- talk about that a little bit for us? Yeah, yeah. And I thought about that a lot, even in my own sort of journey towards being a ski bum. And I um, made it explain myself a little bit when I was fresh out of college. I grew up in Massachusetts. I'm from the East Coast. I went to college in Maine. And I was working as a raft guide during the summers in Maine. And I kind of had this idea that I wanted to move to the mountains after I graduated. And a guy that I worked with kind of randomly was like, oh, I can get you a job in Colorado. So kind of sight unseen, two of my college friends and I got in our cars and drove to Colorado in this kind of, you know, vision that we were going to move to the mountains and be cooler and braver and have an adventure, which I think is really in a lot of ways caked in that kind of idea of like go west young man and like you can move you know move to the horizon and have you know like prove yourself um which i think is you know like baked into so much of this kind of american history of like as a young person you go and prove yourself and like you know go have a you know stretch yourself and have an adventure um and i think that in that kind of frontier mythology there's always this sense of like pushing for the next thing and trying to like achieve something beyond what people before you have done. And I, in a, in the worlds that I'm in, in a lot of ways, it is that kind of physical proving. And so, you know, and it kind of gets back into that idea of like, who's the ski bum, who's the toughest, who's the bravest when everything is kind of explored and mapped and we've figured so much out, how can you, how can you push yourself and make a story for yourself? And I think a lot of that gets to this, you know, who goes bigger, who can go next, how, how, how deep into the backcountry can you go? So it sort of feels to me, and like, there's that ideology is problematic in so many ways and not, not true in so many ways, but I think there is this sort of like generational proving thing that I don't know how much of that is like socially enforced and how much of that is like, as a young person, you just need to like stretch your wings, but there seem to be a lot of these kind of cultural scripts that a lot of us end up kind of playing out on the stage you know, of life. I don't know where sure. this metaphor is going, but uh, <laughs> like whether we're aware of it or not, you know, there are certain scripts that are kind of informing how we view, you know, where we are at different stages in life and the types of things we do. Um, you write, I, I'm sorry to quote your own words back to you because <laughs> it's the worst when people do that. <laughs> um, but kind of of this, this trip, and this is 2005 ish. Mm -hmm. When you make this trip out to Colorado, you wrote, um, some tangled part of me got sucked into a modern manifestation of the frontier fantasy. Problematic as it may be, I latched onto the idea that if I went West, I would be braver and truer. That's an interesting word too, truer Mm -hmm. um, and more exciting. I wanted an adventure I could call my own. So um, how did that pan out? Did you find a braver, more true self? Like through this Western adventure or uh, was it not quite what you expected or were you yeah, so, thinking explicitly in these terms when you did it? 
Yeah, it's, it's funny to kind of like try to reflect back on yourself. And in writing the book, you know, I had this idea or like maybe a story I told about myself where I was like, oh yeah, we like moved to the mountains and all we did was be outside and it was great. And, you know, like it was the most fun time of my life. And I think that was true in some ways, but I've gone back in writing the book. I went back to the journals that I kept and kind of thought about where I actually was at that point where I was you know, 21, 22, trying to figure myself out. And I was so anxious and nervous and not sure if I was in the right place and not sure if I was good enough. And so I think there was this kind of external narrative and I was sort of like in a new place and pushing myself and challenging myself, but I also was very unsure of it at the time. And that's kind of one of the things I've thought about a lot in this idea and sort of this idea that I'm like fascinated with about this idea of the dream and living the dream and these kind of like narratives that we build up and then what it actually looks like on the inside when you're actually a person living it. And then also how you, how you project that externally versus what you feel on the inside. So in some ways, yeah, I had that adventure, but I also was like second guessing and questioning (laughs) the whole time. Yeah. Well, and you were like working as a bartender at a pizza joint, or, I mean, it wasn't all just playing in the outdoors. It was uh, a lot of probably miserable, not fun hours in order to be in the proximity of the place to then go play in the outdoors. Sure, sure. Yeah. These in these towns, these kind of ski towns are built up on the backs of, you know, marginal. You need all these sort of low paid service workers to make a ski town work. And so it is, I skin lift tickets, I waited tables, I babysat, I did all the kind of like, you know, marginal jobs to make it work that I think a lot of people string together in these towns to, to be able to do that thing where skiing is then you can, you can still make the time to go skiing. Yeah. Do you think there's something unique about, um, ski culture in the West compared to, you know, where you grew up in new England, or if you've been to Europe, other places, what's, what's unique about the ski towns and, you know, ski culture out West? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think that this is maybe less true now because there has been more consolidation of ski areas and more resort buildup and that kind of thing. But I think when I first moved West, um, I had kind of been used to skiing at these like smaller mom and pop ski areas, which there are quite a few in New England. And, you know, the one of the mountains I grew up skiing the most Canon is owned by the state of New Hampshire. So it's, you know, pretty low infrastructure. And um, I moved when I moved to Colorado, I started working at Beaver Creek, which is, was one of the last ski areas to be built. And it's kind of one of the fanciest and most resorty, you know, we showed up and there's heated sidewalks and escalators and they give out chocolate chip cookies every day at four. And they're, and at the time, was that kind of, was that an outlier at the time? Kind of that I think there's resort a couple vibe other places of- like that, but that is, you know, Deer Valley, Beaver Creek, there's a couple of these really fancy schmancy ones. And my mind, I was like, this is what skiing, it. what the heck? You know, you have to park in the parking lot and walk through the resort village to get there. So I think that kind of like real ski, ski area versus ski resort is, is it, and I don't think that's necessarily totally split east to west, but I would say a lot of those Western resorts that were maybe built later have more of that infrastructure, more of that kind of the ski, the, when you're visiting, the experience isn't necessarily just about the skiing. It's also about the staying and the food and the shopping and the the vacation versus the, you know, you drive up for the day and you go skiing. Yeah. I and mean, I think you wrote at one point that someone, I don't remember which resort it was at, but said, you know, that a, a family of four is spending a week long vacation, you know, whatever this resort was, maybe dropping twenty thirty thousand dollars $30,000. Yeah. They told that when I worked at Fever Creek, I worked a job that they call guest services, which is basically you're scanning left tickets and then you're on the mountain helping people figure out where they want to go. And, you know, we were making, I don't know what it was in 2006, you know, nine bucks an hour or something. And these people were spending, they kind of told us, you know, these people are spending more on a week than you make in an entire year. And that sort of, and like, I was, you know, I come from plenty of privilege. It's not like I was totally scraping the bottom, but that sort of spread between the top of the pile and the and the work all of a sudden felt so wide. Hmm. So if there are more of these kind of big mega resorts in the in the west, if we can draw like an east-west divide, there's maybe those dynamics also those inequities or 
perhaps more in play in some of these towns, uh, perhaps as well. I mean, the, the mountain I grew up snowboarding is Mount Baker up in Northwest mm-hmm. Washington, yeah. um, where it's not in a city. It's, you know, it's a 45 minute drive out or hour drive out of kind of the main city. And it doesn't have like a hotel. There's, there's, you can't stay there. And uh, the first time when I first moved here to Utah and went to some of the resorts here, I was like, wait, the, there's hotels and um, and restaurants and there's all this infrastructure and stuff that I just I hadn't really uh, hadn't experienced before. Kind of kind of different. Yeah, it's um. I think that also gets back to land use in some ways too. That somewhere like Mount Baker and a lot of the resorts in Washington, Oregon, the Northwest are the way their forest service permits work. They can't build that much more. And somewhere like a snowboarder in Alta or a Deer Park City, Deer Valley, those the way the it's kind of caked into this history of how we've used land in the past, where you're somewhere like a park city where there was already a mining town developed there. The way the landscape is used is super different than a baker where you really are at the end of the road, you know, in the national like literally, forest. Literally. Yeah. Literally at the, the, end, end, of the, road, the yeah. end of the road. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, you're a journalist and an author now, and I'm sure you still ski quite a bit. And we'll talk in this book, you know, you kind of spend this season going back and interviewing people and skiing a lot um does your western ski bum pass um factor into your your self-identity today or or how you approach your work as a journalist <laughs> yeah Sorry. um yeah absolutely and that's something in the way the way i thought about and you know like magazine journalism or something that's a little bit more newsy and fact-based is different than a book project but i think when i've thought about writing books. And I think this book in particular, a lot of it comes, starts from a, a question. And, you know, this book in particular really started from this. Sometimes I wonder if it's a little bit selfish and I just, you know, wrote this book to try and figure out my own life, but, you know, it kind of came from this question about, you know, is, is being a skier, a ski bum, is it good? You know, like, is it worthy of like a way that to kind of frame up your life? And then also, is it, viable right now? And was it ever? And like, how is it changing? Um, And that question really came from, you know, me, my own life. I, I did that kind of ski bump thing for a while. And then I washed out of it because I had gotten hurt and I was stressed about money and purpose and that kind of thing. But I watched a lot of my friends and peers kind of like keep at it and become, you know, patrol directors or avalanche forecasters, and then try to have families and communities and careers in these towns. And it kind of was this question of like, is this a good way to be? Did I miss out on something? So I think, yeah, that looking at this sort of specific culture and lifestyle through a prism of like my own experience through it. I don't know, when I think about writing, I, and also think about reading and like the books that I like, I often think that kind of first person narrator stake on the ground is what grabs me. So from a like reading perspective and a writing perspective, that felt like a wedge into this question that was, you know, I was tied to, but was also bigger than me. Do you feel like you found satisfactory answers for yourself? No. Some of this was a personal <laughs> quest. No, yeah. you just, there's, I mean, I there's think, now more unanswered questions than you started with. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. And I think that's, that's probably true of anything I've ever written. <laughs> And I think that that, you know, if there had been, if I had been able to come to some clear answer, A, I don't know if it would have been a super interesting question in the first place. And B, I think it would have been a really different, you know, if there, if the book had been like, here's how to be a ski bum, that would have been a really different kind of book. Yeah. And one that, I don't know, I don't know if anyone would want to read. I, I don't know. I think the best work is work that generally like, in the end opens more doors than it closes, you know, sure. that's, yeah. that's the stuff that's worth digging into and thinking yeah. about. And like, there's um, no, there's no one way to do anything. I don't think like there's no right way to be like, okay, here, if you like do these jobs and check these boxes, you can make it work. <laughs> so um, is it in 2020 then that you start this project, this season of kind of touring back around through Colorado and some other places and interviewing all these people and, uh, so it'd been about, uh, 15 years since when you, you started kind of your ski thing yeah. in the West. Yeah. It was um, 2018, 2019 was the winter okay. that I did, which is, okay. you know, an interesting time period because it was pre COVID. 
which is really different the, these days. The before times. Yeah. Before times. Yeah. Yeah. So I, that, that winter I kind of got on the road, you know, I was living in Washington state at the time and I sort of did this big, I spent a little time on the East coast and then I did this kind of big looping road trip through, you know, starting in Washington, going all the way down to New Mexico, Arizona, doing this kind of big loop through ski country. Yeah. That sounds horrible. Wow. What, yeah, a, what a horrible, <laughs> what a horrible winter. Um, you know, like they say, like you can never go home again. Um, and that, that sense, I know you don't use those exact words, but that sense comes out a lot as you're revisiting places that you used to live before, um, seeing uh, people that you knew from, you know, kind of this previous life. Um, how does like, uh, your, like the sense of nostalgia, um, kind of color your interpretation of these places like when you when you return to them uh, and, and I'm I think and I'm also curious like if there are things you think are useful and productive about that nostalgia that kind of drives mm. you um, but also like what might be counterproductive or how it may obscure things in ways that make kind of your, your project uh, more difficult mm, yeah and I think that nostalgia factor is so entrenched in skiing like there is so much about ski culture that is sort of backward looking even the you know like 80s onesie parties that people have and the even the idea of opera is sort of this like very european you know backward looking culture so i think there is so much this kind of history caked into it and um and i kind of had to fight through that for myself and it was you know, so I kind of like dropped into this road trip and a lot of towns I was, I went back to, you know, Colorado and the Vail Valley where I had, you know, been a young person and then also was dropping into all these other towns. And in a lot of ways it was, it was sort of creepily easy. You know, it kind of felt like I could just show up and it, in some ways it felt like nothing had changed, you know, the pattern, I kind of knew the patterns and I could, you know, there were still, I showed up at Beaver Creek where I worked and like, the old guy on ski patrol was still the old guy on ski patrol. And so in some ways it almost feels like time doesn't move, but then you really drop in and you're like, Oh no, things have changed. So it was this, there was, and you could kind of almost, it's almost like you switched the, it's like the red lens, blue lens of the 3d glasses that in some ways you're like, Oh, it's the same. And then if you look at it from another angle, you're like, Oh, it actually, things are very different, but in some ways people are still trying to hold on to those same patterns. And I think, um, in a ski culture is changing and has changed and has to change. But I think in a lot of ways, the things, and there are outside forces that are really pressuring these, these places in a lot of ways. But I think sometimes the thing that holds skiing up from the inside, and I think this is true in a lot of cultures and probably true in America in general, but that there is this sense of nostalgia and the sense of like, things should always be the way they used to be. The town should look the same, you know, the, the people should kind of be the same. And I think that really prevents change in a lot of ways. I know in, in terms of from a, even a housing standpoint, a lot of towns are kind of facing this conflict where, you know, people want them to look the same and have the cute little mm -hmm. gingerbread houses. Um, and that means that there's not enough growth or enough housing to support the population. So there's, I think there's a lot of these ways where that idea of nostalgia and this idea of like, here's what, the specific, here's what a ski town looks like. Here's what the American West looks like really prevents us from changing in these necessary and productive ways. And I think that's true of this. You know, we talked earlier about this ski bum archetype and that sort of narrow vision based in history means that it's not opening the doors to other people who could be a part of it. Hmm. So even as like a lot of your book is discussing, like just the really profound and rapid change that that is undergoing there. Yeah, when we when we have these spaces that we intentionally curate to look a specific way and to feel a specific way, that may serve as a, a force to slow down change. Yeah, but, curate's an interesting but, but, word. But, yeah. but scrape over the 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 scrape across the, the surface off, and things are, are profoundly different than yeah, yeah than maybe they were. I mean, one one passage you, you write kind of about this. Yeah, like like cur curating or like yeah, manufacturing a specific kind of uh, uh, cult, cult visual culture or uh, 
and you're writing here about um, kind of these ski towns and ski villages. And you say the, um, I think this, where's the hostel at? That's in Teton, oh, right? Oh, Jackson, this, yeah. This is in Jackson. Yeah, you say the village is a caricature of the American West, right? Like, you know, people, like, there's cowboy boots and belt buckles. and I'm Oh, sure, yeah. And, and, you know, like, the, the decor, you know, in a lot of the restaurants and stuff, it's all very kind of Wild West mountain men with buffalo and moose and stuff. Anyways, you say... Um, it's a caricature of the American West pushed through the fondue choked arteries of pseudo European lavishness as if Heidi went elk hunting in Yellowstone. That's a really great sentence. <laughs> um, I don't know if when you wrote that, if you were like, yes, <laughs> nailed it. <laughs> That's so great. I just was in Switzerland last month uh, presenting on my, my new research and explicitly thinking about like the Alps versus the American West mountains and like, the cultural ideas that we project on them and see how this verbiage of like Heidi, you know, elk hunting and the Yellowstone fondue yeah. choked arteries. Oh my goodness. But it is so like so many towns like Vail, where I first moved, you have all this like, you know, like gingerbread wood trim, even the aesthetics are very hearkening back to this really European idea. And that came from the early days of the people who are building ski resorts, you know, the, the uh, 10th mountain division folks who had been skiing in Europe and came back and built these ideas. And it's really a funny sort of, you can get used to it, but if you think about it, you're like, wait a second, like yeah, this is what? Colorado. This is not yeah. like, we can, we could have built whatever we wanted, but I think, yep. I know you had Justin Farrell on at one point. I, I want to get, get to him. So yeah, let, let's, yeah. let's jump, jump into it. Uh, yeah. Well, he has this great yeah. piece in his book where he's talking about, you know, the, the kind of like, people with money coming to especially the Jackson area where it's really, you know, probably one of the places where that's most intense in the country. And you have these people coming in and it's like, they want the, the dusty cowboy boots and the hat, but they, they kind of want these like visual markers of being in it. But then they also want, you know, the brand new house and the, you know, you're kind of picking and choosing those aesthetic cues and like deciding how to shape the image of it. And that often comes from this kind of like who has the money top down construction. Yeah. And these dusty cowboy boots, if you look closely, they're like five thousand dollar cowboy boots oh, yeah, or something yeah. that have that been they got in or something. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. This I mean you see a lot of that in these Western mountain towns that have become really re resortified. Uh, that's not a word, but um but you know what I mean, uh with these influxes of just huge amounts of money. Uh and I mean, for, yeah, for listeners, if you go back to, I don't remember what episode number would be, but Justin Farrell is a sociologist, uh, I think at Yale, if I remember correctly, um, who wrote this book, Billionaire Wilderness, about not just the wealthy in, you know, Jackson Hole, Teton County, Wyoming, but the like ultra wealthy, these people that, that they're existing on an, a, a level above the, the regular rich and they're choosing to come to Jackson and Teton for specific kinds of experiences. Um, and they have the money to, to kind of curate that experience for themselves, but yeah. it may not be really authentic to the place. Um, yeah. And like, I get it. I did that too. I came to this place cause I wanted that experience, but there is, there is this stratification in this level where if you're coming in from a place that's totally removed from the economic base of the community and you have the power to change it, then you're shaping that place in a really specific way. Yeah. We also, uh, on the podcast, we had um, Ryan Pilgrim uh, who wrote a book called Pushed Out about gentrification um, up kind of like towards Sandpoint, Idaho, Coeur d'Alene area, but similar dynamics of uh, the kind of the crisis that locals are in and existing local economies when their surrounding area really starts to become transformed by tourism and recreation, which is a really, I mean, there's a, a, big uh western historian uh, he's now passed hal rothman uh, who was at unlv wrote a book called devil's bargain it's about so uh, yeah i mean uh it, you know yeah about tourism and how for many places uh tourism with with the waning of extractive industries and mining and logging uh tourism was a a, a viable way to keep a local economy going but it's a devil's bargain it comes with costs um that are going to be borne by, by that, that, you know, existing local population. I mean, you write, uh, you write, uh, the recreation industry has long been heralded as the rural West. And I, I think this is something really specific 
often to the rural West, um, as the rural West's great economic answer to the demise of the extraction industry. Um, what are some of the costs that you saw maybe in your, your during your ski bum life, but then now as you return back, you know, a decade later and you've seen more of this transition to large scale swanky resorts and stuff, well, what are the costs being borne by these local rural Western populations? Yeah. Yeah. And it's such an interesting, like, I, I'm thinking about this a lot in, in this book and in the work I'm doing in other places, but I think that, you know, this idea that recreation could come in and be an economic source in these places that had been, you know, a lot of these ski towns that we're talking about, Aspen, Telluride, Park City were mining towns, were towns that had an extractive industry. Um, and that's true, you know, way broader than skiing too. You look at a Moab or something like that. Um, and this idea that, you know, you could come in and you could bring tourists and that wouldn't be environmentally destructive in the same way. And you could have this sort of viable economy, I think is a really nice idea, but I think part of the, a big part of the devil's bargain. And I think this is, you know, a bigger picture question is that how, the question of like, how do you put bounds around that and how do you make it sustainable in a way that, that, you know, allows for economic, I don't even know if growth is really the right word, but like economic sustainability, um, in, in an economy that's inherently based on use and is inherently based on, um, external forces. So this, I think one of the, and this is such a big complicated question, so I'm kind of like fumbling here, but I think that, you know, the hard part in these places where you have, you know, the idea of like you build a ski town, you have people coming in, there's jobs that it's based on the money from outside places. And, and a lot of these places where resorts have gone big and now the management isn't based in these towns. Um, the economic base is now totally removed from the place. And I think this is true, especially now that so many people can work and operate remotely. Mm -hmm. Um, and I feel yeah. like I'm like talking myself down three different wormholes right now. So I don't know if I'm like getting <laughs> this, no, this. this is the sign of like a good project because yeah, uh, yeah. it's just it's just always well, it's it's complicated. Could just be the answer yeah, to every could be, yeah. And it totally is question. complicated. And the, you know, um this makes me think of uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Jim Stiles. He's a, a journalist down in Moab. He runs a, a newspaper called the Canyon County Zephyr or the Canyon Zephyr. Um, and he wrote a book. I mean, now it's 20 ish years ago called Brave New West. It was this little book, but kind of about Moab. And I mean, he came, he's, he was like an acolyte of Ed Abbey kind of coming out of that world and kind of lamenting the rapid growth and change that was happening in Moab. And how uh, I mean those that that the tourism dollars uh, allowed are, are in some ways good for a city, but it it really kind of changed the the face of the city. And as you as you were just kind of saying, um, I mean this is kind of the direction you were trying to head in was when more and more of the dollars, like the consumption dollars, like the dollars that are being spent to consume tourism in a place or to consume like goods or whatever it is in a place are dollars that come from somewhere else right from people just dropping in for a week and then leaving uh that creates just like weird imbalances yeah uh, or even like real estate's a really interesting example of that where say you want to buy a house in moab and you're somebody who i'm getting into total stereotypes but like you live in la and <laughs> you just like being there sometimes and you make la money and spending a million and a half dollars on a house is like not that big of a deal to you. That's really different than being a person who works as a raft guide in Moab and is trying to like find a house to live in, but from a straight supply and demand, you know, strata, there's no reason why the LA person is going to win out, but that really changes the dynamic of who is able to live in these places. And that's happening in a lot of these recreation towns across the, across the West in particular, across the country where that the ability to even just live in the place is not based on who works in the place. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. this is like, as you noted, probably accelerating with the growth of remote work because now someone could actually now go live in whatever rural town in the West, Moab or wherever else while still full time, but while making LA money. 
Yeah, yeah. And paying potentially California taxes. But for like the local real estate market, property values and stuff, for the people who are just working all the normal jobs in town, suddenly they're priced out and they, especially thinking about some of your ski bum friends who you said, you know, as you kind of, you know, went on to do other things and some of them stuck it out, but they're trying to like still do some of those things that they had sacrificed before, like have a family, like maybe buy a home, have some of that stability and make the ski bum thing still work. Uh, when the real estate market, you know, everything quadruples, quintuples in price, that becomes even less tenable to make that transition to being a homeowner and building equity. Sure. And you just can't, you just get your, your price down. Yeah. And it's like, especially these people who have spent the last, you know, 15, 20 years, maybe moving up in ski patrol or, you know, these kind of like, or even working as, you know, teachers or in healthcare, these, you know, like these jobs that are really necessary to make communities function. And they've been sort of steadily chipping away. And then all of a sudden somebody comes in from the outside and is like, you know, I'll take that house. It just creates yeah. this, it really hollows out the core of these communities. And I think you're really seeing it. It's not just a hypothetical, you know, this is really happening in especially these really rarefied ski towns like a Jackson, like an Aspen. I was in Park City a couple weeks ago and I'm going to get the numbers wrong, but um, it's something like 80% of people who work in, in town don't live there. That like most people who actually work in the town are commuting in from yep. surrounding areas because they can't afford to, but the town still depends on all these people. So it's this really tricky. At one point, at what point does that sort of start to crash is this interesting question that I think we're kind of looking at right now. Yeah, we um. So from Park City, if you go uh, south, uh, what direction would it be south and east to the next valley down? It's the Heber Valley, mm -hmm. which traditionally was just this very rural, quiet, agricultural. And they have like mid. There's it's Heber and Midway. Midway is actually kind of a little Swiss mm -hmm. town because there were Swiss immigrants there. Speaking of like gingerbread looking Alpine houses, you know, <laughs> they have a Swiss Days Festival. But anyways, and it was this really kind of sleepy little community. And over the last ten to fifteen years. Um, like the Park City unaffordability is now is now spilling over uh, into Heber, and it the the valley has just exploded, and property values are just and so even though Heber the Heber Valley doesn't have a ski resort, they're thirty minutes from Park City, and so like it it it, it it's cascading outward some of these like real estate crises and uh, and so forth. Um, oh yeah, absolutely. And then like you know people are driving. At what point does, and this happens yeah. in cities too, like, but at what point does it become untenable yeah. to be driving? I was talking to some ski patrollers in Park City and they were saying, you know, they're driving in now an hour, 45 minutes, and they have to be there at 5 a.m. to do avalanche control. And it's like, at what point does that just become unsafe and unrealistic? Especially like if there'd been a big storm and like, yeah. so it's not just a normal 45 minute commute it's on bad roads so maybe it's a two-hour commute now. yeah and you're exhausted um, and you were there late it's and it gets into these really interesting mental health impacts too of like you know the people who are trying to live in these towns are really it their lives become explicitly harder because of these factors and it's kind yeah. of all this web is really interconnected of like what's the what becomes worth it who can who can make it happen what does your life actually look like if you're trying to make it work in these towns yeah, I mean, you have a short chapter talking about some of the darker, like mental health uh, crises in the, in these communities. Um, something is probably being largely, largely overlooked by most. Um, I published an anthology on the 21st century West uh, last year, and uh, a, prof a professor from Colorado State, Ernesto Sagas, wrote a chapter about um, Latino uh, Latinos uh, in the Colorado Mountains and. Mm -hmm there's some big sections about these wage workers who, yeah, they work in Aspen, uh, like as, you know, restaurant or in hotels, like, you know, they're the staff running these hotels, but they live an hour and a half away, um, in a mobile home or in a trailer. Um, that's not, um, it's only sustainable on the backs of, uh, Low, very low wage labor that doesn't have collective bargaining rights that uh, many of them maybe are undocumented. So there's other differentials of like, they just don't have the power to really fight for themselves. Uh, but Aspen does not exist and does not function without this huge low wage labor force often, oh. you know, which are, you know, people of color 
immigrants, uh, so forth. Oh, a hundred percent. And like that kind of gets back to this nostalgia idea of like what these towns look like and what we think they look like. A lot of these counties and towns are now 30, 50%, you know, Latino, like it's not the reality of who is actually working and making these towns operate does not always reflect this idea of like our adorable little ski bum, you know, bartending and living in their shack. Yeah. And it's like in a lot of these, you know, and these are all such complicated entrenched questions that get into all these different policy issues, but like to make these places sustainable, it is like, okay, what's the reality of it? And how do we support, is it support housing? Is it try, you know, like, what are the, what are the factors that need to be in play to like actually make these places tenable? And how do we have to like, look at that reality? I think it was just yesterday. I saw a headline uh, here that park city, maybe it was, it was within the last couple of days. Um, they just announced a big new um, housing project, but specifically they're building like affordable uh, apartments and condos that I think they're going to have price controls on. I think it's some, you know, like the city, the state or the county is involved. So it's not, I don't think it's fully public housing, but there's some kind of arrangement, but trying to answer this, yeah. uh, this crisis. But again, I think most of those are going to go to probably more like white collar type workers uh and the the lower wage uh the you know core of the workforce i think is probably still gonna be living living elsewhere um i mean you you write this you kind of one liner that increasingly in these cities people either um has a second home or a second job right and there, there's like no middle it's either yeah, people yeah. that are there this these super rich elite or it's people that are really scraping scraping by yeah, absolutely. And I think it is, I mean, this is part of why I think it's sort of interesting to look at ski towns is that I think these issues are happening across the country, you know, like economics becoming more stratified, housing being an issue. And in some of these places, like a park city, it's become so, it's like we're in this crisis emergency mode that we've had to come up with solutions and find ways to make it work. So I think it is sort of interesting to look at how these places are trying to address those questions and like, are there lessons from a park city or something like that, that apply, you know, like looking at these places that are so far out on the end of the spectrum, how are they trying to fix it? And can there be, you know, can other people, how, how are they canaries in the coal mine for like how other communities are going to have to deal with it? Yeah. And I mean, and we'll see park city may not be the best example because it is, it's, it's weird in that it is in very close proximity to huge population mm -hmm. centers, right? Whereas, you know, like Jackson Hole, it's it's kind of way out there, you know. Sure, Salt Lake sure, City yeah. is just right here. So it is kind of a, a weird one. Um, and as you, you know, went out skiing and, you know, drinking beers and hanging out with all these old ski bums, uh, how aware are they or how are they talking about how all of these kind of economic developments are changing their ski culture? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and this is sort of an interesting part of doing my research. And I think, you know, skiing is so fun for this and so specific because I think there are really few other venues or places where you sit down in the chairlift with a stranger and you have 10 minutes to kind of like undivided talk to somebody. And I mean, there's phones and headphones and stuff, so it doesn't always happen. But I was really, you know, and I was sort of cautious in a lot of ways because I was coming and trying to ask these people about questions that are potentially really sensitive or personal. And I was really shocked at how much people were really willing to talk about the hard parts. And, you know, like almost everywhere, people were really confronting those affordability questions. You know, <clears throat> housing in particular was something that almost everybody talked about. Um, and I was really shocked at how much that mental health stuff came up too and how much people were it was kind of front of mind the second I opened the door, you know, people had stories and were willing to talk about it. Was that generational? Like the people who'd been at this for a couple of decades, or did you see that mental awareness and mental health things like amongst like the new crew of, you know, of you in 2005, like those new kids showing up? I think there's a, there is a generational thing where I think younger people have the language to talk about mental health a little bit better. And I think they're, you know, one of the problems with, talking about struggling, like, especially like not feeling good mental health stuff in these places that it is, that it is entrenched in that kind of 
you know, Western cowboy tough guy culture mm. where you Rugged are individuals. sort of totally. Yeah. yeah. And it's been like very male centric and this kind of idea that your social capital in a lot of ways is based on how tough you are and how willing mm. you are to like confront risk and go do big things. So I think there is this sort of social thing where like you never want to show weakness because you're place in the in the community is based on how tough you know how cool and tough you are um that is this kind of like old cowboy or your you know like your job might be based on that and so i think that that's a really hard thing to break down for a lot of people and i think that especially kind of like the old crusty guys struggle with that a bit and i think that younger people is that a form is that an official term old crusty guys old crusties, i think it is yeah, yeah. okay <laughs> I didn't make they, that, they would that own. I think they. Would, I yeah. think they would own that term. <laughs> yeah, and I think there are some people really working. And I like the mental health chapter that you mentioned. I kind of, you know, in the book, I kind of tagged these questions and issues to places. And a lot of, you know, I'd be in a place looking at a, you know, in Aspen, I was looking at economics, and I looked at mental health in Utah because Utah, in a lot of ways, has super high suicide rates. There's a lot of kind mm-hmm. of factors there, um, but there are people in that community really in the ski community in particular, really working to try and break down those stereotypes and try and at least like start conversations about, Hey, it's normal if you don't feel great and cool all the time. And like, we are in these kind of high stress, you know, physical stress and sort of social stress situations. And that's, that's real and that's valid. And like, we need to kind of like bring that stuff up to the light. Well, that's a, that's hopeful though, that there's awareness and people are like the people in the trenches are bringing that conversation to the forefront. That's, that's good to hear. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that is actually somewhere that there is a lot of positive action. Um, there's a guy, Drew Peterson, who's a skier out of Colorado initially, and he had a film that came out a year or two ago about his kind of struggles with, you know, depression, suicide, that kind of thing. And I went to a screening of it and there was probably, I was kind of sitting outside talking to him for a minute and probably like 10 different guys came by and kind of said, Hey, thank you for opening the store. Even in that, you know, 15 minutes I was with him. So I think there is that you wedge the door open just a little bit and people are ready to talk about it. Thing mm-hmm. going on with that. Um, oh my goodness. I have so many more things I wanted to talk <laughs> about. Um, we didn't talk about the 10th mountain division much like these world war two, ski army guys who come back and really kind of kickstart the ski industry we didn't talk about climate change and unpredictability of ski seasons or the shrinking of ski seasons and the real unequal uh, access that different resorts have to you know snow making technology to basically extend the season like as long as they want which is i think going to accelerate the decline of the mom and pops that are scraping by and they cute like you know, Vail Resorts now owns how many? It's not just Vail. They own, you know, oh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, there's just so, oh gosh. Actually, I, mean, I was just, yesterday, Um, we hosted uh, Erica uh, Bazumik, who's a professor at the University of Texas. And um, yeah, she has a PhD student who's working, who's writing a dissertation on the history of manufacturing snow. Oh, interesting. Um, and I'm like, oh my, yes, yes. Like, yeah. Uh, Anyway, because that that's a whole entire you know yeah, other yeah. topic. I was going to say mean, you is... need to write a book on that, but actually don't let this, <laughs> let let this grad that, yeah. student publish their book on it. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, as we kind of try to wrap things up, I don't want to end on like on sour notes, uh, but uh, in so many ways, uh, being a skier or a snowboarder in the United States is something that fewer and fewer people can do as prices you know go up um as so many of the resorts become these kind of big huge mega uh resort things um the industry is under all kinds of stress but um do you see um other kind of i mean we talked a little about the, about the mental health oh, well awareness of mental health in the community that's good um do you see other glimmers of hope like um pass forward uh things that make it not all doom and gloom yeah. And I mean, you just framed up all the hard things. So I know. I'm trying to get them out of the way yeah. so you can talk about the other Let's stuff. go positive. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think there is, I mean, I thought a lot about, you know, part of this was, you know, like me looking at my generational thing. And I think I've been thinking a lot about how my peers are the adults now, you know, like we're not just the 
baby ski bums, you know, trying to fit into the system. And I think I've seen that, you know, how do we, how do we try and take back power and change the systems? Is that <clears throat> urban planning in these cities? Is this trying to just open the lens on who looks like a skier, which I think there is definitely work happening on like who gets to be outside in any capacity. Um, and I think it's, these are tough entrenched problems that come from decades of moving in these kind of questionable directions that come from the bigger picture climate questions. So I think, yeah, I don't have any kind of like, Hey, here's like the rosy, you know, we can, if we just do this, we can make it all better. <laughs> um, but I think that, you know, why I think it's interesting to look at skiing is like, and I thought a lot about, is it even worth looking at skiing? Like this is the sort of like specific rarefied recreational thing that we do. And, but I do think it is important to think about like fun and joy and having that space and making that space is open and equitable for everybody. And I think one of my big mentors, his kind of thing about conservation and saving things is like, we, we save what we love and we love what we know. And I think if you start from this place of like, here's the thing that I love, I want to protect it, then you're going to fight for that. So I think that, yeah, there's a lot of big systemic things that are tough, but I think it's like, it only gets worse if we don't work on it. So. And think there's a lot of people who love yeah. these places and these activities. So hopefully there'll be a lot of people fighting uh, for yeah. it or or willing to put in the work to ask hard questions and find difficult solutions. Yeah. And you look at sort of like, I think there's much more awareness about climate stuff. You look at groups like protect our winners that are taking that idea of like caring about skiing and snow and turning that into political action and lobbying. Like, I think there are ways that you can take those things and, and shoot them out forward and bigger. Um, well, Heather, tell us about what you're working on next. Yeah. I'm like in the, in the pain cave on a new book, um, All right. which is about women in the outdoors. And I'm looking, it's much more historical than anything I've done before, which is challenging and fun. But I'm looking at three women who I think were pretty pivotal in how we now spend time outside and recreate and kind of telling their untold stories and also looking at if we hadn't just paid attention to those kind of archetypal outdoors people and had looked at other people's stories, how would we be outside differently? I so it. it's another one of those kind of like questions that stemmed from my own life of, you know, why didn't I have mentors and women that I could look up to and how would things have been different if I had? Yeah, that's that. There's a lot of adjacent um, projects and nonprofits and organizations kind of thinking about the same thing, not just like women in sports and the outdoors, but all kinds of people who've not been the kind of mold that we've thought about the types of people who inhabit these spaces um, and trying to push and say like, no, like, like there are other people out there. And if there aren't enough, of these other people out there, how do we make spaces for them? And how do we yeah. make them feel welcome and stuff in these, these kinds of um, recreational worlds? So that's, that's exciting. I'm, I'll be eagerly anticipating it or feel free to send me, you know, early drafts of chapters and um oh man you know, they're so my, messy my right own, now <laughs> my own pleasurable reading i know i know and it's another one of those things where it's like it becomes this any wormhole you go down sort of touches everything else where it is like yeah how did we who did we like how do we think about that frontier myth and how does it play out and how we spend time outside you know who you know how did the automobile impact how our record you know there's all these things that you know once you start to touch it it goes in all these different directions yeah, a million other books you could write. That's the problem. Yeah. Um, uh, well, thanks so much for uh, spending a little time with us. Congrats on the book. I know it's been out for a couple of years, but I think there's like a new paperback out. Paperback but... comes out November 7th. I should know oh, that date. So exactly, it's just coming out. That... Oh, yeah, great. yeah. Paperback is coming out. Great. Well, congrats so, on that. Go to your local bookstore and look for it. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, thank you, Heather. And um, I, hope, uh, I hope we'll cross paths sometime. Yeah. Thanks for having me on here. This is really fun. All right. Take care. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you'll subscribe and listen every month. Please leave us a review on whatever app or platform you're listening through. Or follow us on Facebook at Writing Westward Podcast or on Twitter at Writing West, where you can get updates and leave comments. 
Writing Westward is a production of the Charles Rudd Center for Western Studies at Brigham Young University. We're an interdisciplinary research center that supports academic research and the promotion of public understandings about the North American West. We host regular public lectures, which we live stream, have an annual funding cycle with award, grant, and fellowship categories that nearly anyone researching or working on the region from any disciplinary approach or towards any final product can apply. Learn more at redcenter.byu.edu. That's R-E-D-D Center. Our theme music was provided by local Utah composer Micah Dahl Anderson. Find him at Micah, D-A-H-L, Dahl, Anderson, with an O, dot com. I'll put a link in the episode description. My name is Brendan Rensink. I serve as the podcast host, producer, and just about everything else. So you can direct any praise or critique my way. I'm author and editor of a number of books on the West, borderlands, native peoples, genocide studies, religion, and the environment. Recently, my book, Native But Foreign, Indigenous Immigrants and Refugees in the North American Borderlands, published by Texas A&M University Press in 2018, won the Best Historical Nonfiction Book Award from the Western Writers of America. In an anthology I co-edited with P. Jane Hafen, entitled Essays on American Indian and Mormon History, published by the University of Utah Press in 2019, won the Metcalf Best Anthology Book Prize from the John Whitmer Historical Association. Here at the Red Center, I'm also general editor and project manager of a great digital history, uh, public history project named Intermountain Histories. It's a free mobile app and website, uh, intermountainhistories.org, that curates student researched and written micro histories of the region, complete with archival photos, bibliographies, and more. To contact me about the podcast, my own research, or anything else, head to bwrensink, that's R E N S I N K, dot org or follow me on Twitter at Brendan W. Rensink. Until next month, be well, be curious, and be kind. Cheers.